This is the old money lecture. And for those who have been here before, you kind of know how this goes. Um, Guido Holzman stole all my thunder, so I have to scramble around and you know, find out something different. But um, money is very misunderstood. Um, if you read the paper today, this is Deflation Defies Expectations in Japan. This is today's Wall Street Journal. They just can't figure out what's going on in Japan. We don't know how deflation works. Um, gentleman who studied Japan uh, with Ben Bernanke, and who better to study Japan than Ben Bernanke? <laughs> they just can't figure out what's going on there. Government plays a role. Japanese officials responded to the crisis, but guess what? They just didn't do enough. They didn't cut rates quick enough. They didn't cut rates low enough. Zero is just plain not low enough. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, according to the Taylor rule I read recently, uh, John Taylor has some kind of rule, um, the interest rate should now be negative four. So, um, you can imagine a lot of people wanting to, wanting to uh, save a dollar so they can get 96 cents back. Makes perfect, makes perfect sense to me. But anyway, of course, that's not our story of money. Our story of money begins with Carl Menger. He developed, of course, the complete theory of social interactions, which arise when humans interact, not central bankers creating money, but actually humans, like the people in this room who have subjective knowledge and experience, and a spontaneous evolution occurs, and um, patterns of behavior occur that aid each person in attaining their goals. And that's what economics is all about, begins and ends with the individual person. And nothing is more central to that than the evolution of money. Money makes the division of labor possible and the satisfaction of wants attainable. And he laid all this out in a little bitty book that's for sale downstairs, The Origins of Money. Unfortunately, Mr. Menger cannot be here to sign it for you, but you know, think about picking that up later. Oh, this other guy. Yeah, don't worry about him. <laughs> anyway. Don't worry about him. All right, so Menger said, men have been led with increasing knowledge of their individual interest, each of his own economic interest, without convention, without legal compulsion. In other words, no legal tender laws or anything like that. Nay, even without any regard to common interest to exchange goods destined for exchange, for other goods equally destined for exchange, but more saleable. And that's what he means by that is that, you know, you trade something that's less saleable, say your time. Now I'm sure everybody in here is very talented, but what would you rather have? $20 bill or the guy next to you or the girl next to you a couple hours of their time? You'd probably take the $20 bill, not recognizing necessarily the, uh, the value that they might provide in an hour or two, two hours. $20 is, is recognized. In fact, you know, this is what, oops, oops, how about that? There we go. That's what $20 used to look like in 1895, I believe. Yeah, doesn't quite look like that today, but that's what it was in 1895. And so, um, so that's what, what money is all about. It's the most saleable good you have. If you, want to want, if you want to know what's saleable, have a garage sale. You'll find out that all these treasures that you paid 20 bucks for are now worth 20 cents. In fact, if you put 20 cents on them, somebody's gonna come by and they wanna offer you a dime. And eventually you just say, why don't you just take it and get out of my face. So that's what happens in a garage sale. Everybody should do that to find out the value of money. So with the extension of traffic and space and with the ex expansion over longer periods of time of provision for satisfying material needs, 
each individual would learn from his own economic interest to take good heed that he bartered his less saleable goods for those special commodities which displayed, besides the attraction of being highly saleable, in particular locality, a wide range of saleableness both in time and place. That means that money holds its value over time, doesn't spoil. Like, say, I'm going to use the example of eggs, which might, uh, which might spoil, or I think Guido was talking about fish earlier, right? Uh, of course, the smart German dug a hole and, you know, had water and held his fish, and pretty soon you'll get sick of how great the Germans are during the course <laughs> of the week, but anyway. So these wares would be qualified by their costliness, their easy transport, uh, transportability, fitness for preservation, to ensure that the possessor a power, not only here and now, but as nearly as possible, unlimited in space and time generally, over all other market goods at economic prices. So that's what Carl Menger wrote so many years ago. Now, Menger's work was continued ad infinitum to the beginning of history. In fact, this theorem reflects Menger's theory of spontaneous emergence and evolution of money. You can trace it that far back. So what that means is, is that money can only be created, created by the free market. It's the only way that it's established. Not by government just printing up pieces of paper, but ultimately, in the beginning, money must be created by the free market. You wouldn't trade your time and talent if somebody just offered, if I offered you a piece of paper and made a French dollar, or a French franc, for that matter. So you would, uh, you would insist that it have a value over time, and that value would, would have been shown by the market um, and what it fetched the day before. So money can't be created in either, um, any other way. You can't just uh, create money out of, out of nowhere. So the knowledge of, of money prices is from the immediate past, and the only way this can happen is by beginning with a useful commodity under barter, and then adding demand for a medium for exchange to the previous demand for use. And in the, probably the best example is that gold coin there. Gold has historically had a, a use as a ornamental value. Thus, governments powerless to create money for the economy can only be developed by the process, again, of the free market. Now, what Murray Rothbard said was, money is a commodity, and learning this simple lesson is one of the world's most important tasks. And this is important. Not very many people really know what money is, and I'll try to illustrate that through the course of this talk. But as he writes, so often people have talked about money as something much more than what it is. Money is not an abstract unit of account, divorceable from a concrete good. It is not a useless token, only good for exchanging. It is not a claim on society. It is not a guarantee of a fixed price level. It is simply a commodity. It differs from other commodities in being demanded mainly as a medium of exchange, but aside, aside from this, it is a commodity. And like all commodities, it has an existing stock. It faces demands by people to buy and hold it. And like all commodities, its price in terms of other goods is determined by the interaction of its total supply or stock and the total demand by people to buy and hold it. People buy money by selling their goods and services, just as they sell money when they buy goods and services. So that was Rothbard's view. So we've got Menger, we've got Mises, we've got Rothbard, and it seems only fair that I should call on Paul Samuelson and his 11th edition of his textbook of economics to see what Paul Samuelson has to say about money. Now, you guys may already know about Samuelson because you may already use him as a textbook. 
at your local university. But he writes, actually, uh, he starts out pretty good. Most kinds of money tended once to be of some value or use for its own sake. So far, so good. He writes, thus, even wampum had decorative uses. Yeah, wampum is the first example I would have reached for, too. <laughs> and paper money began as a warehouse or mint receipts for such metal. Something like this. You can see, hopefully, that it says here, payer to $5 in silver, payable on demand. Now, these are still floating around, but I wouldn't recommend you go to the treasury and try to get silver for it. They would trade that $5 bill for another one. But that's the, re, uh, the, uh, the mint receipts, essentially, or the modern version thereof. Uh, that occurred over time. But the intrinsic usefulness of money, he writes, uh, or the money medium, is now the least important thing about it. But money's intrinsic value is now laid bare, writes Samuelson. Money as money is wanted not for its own sake, but by what, by what it will buy. We wish to use money by getting rid of it. And here's the big one. This is where he really tells you. He says, money is an artificial social convention. Paradox, he writes, money is accepted because it is accepted, unquote. <laughs> well, you know how you'd say that today. People say it all the time. It is what it is. And he's essentially writing that money is what it is. Well, I used to... Uh, uh, when my girlfriend, who's in the audience, would ask me a question and I didn't know the answer, and I would always say, well, it is what it is. Well, she's a lawyer and she would never be quite satisfied with that answer. She would continue to grill me and I really didn't have anything better to offer, so I would just continue with that is what it is. But that's Samuelson's, uh, essentially, his uh, explanation of money in the 11th edition of his book. He writes, goes on to write, by the printing of more or fewer zeros on the face of a bill, a greater or smaller amount of money can be embodied in a light, transportable medium of little bulk. By careful engraving, the value of money can be protected from counterfeiting and adulteration. The fact that private individuals cannot create it at unlimited amounts keeps it scarce i.e. an economic <laughs> and not a free good. <laughs> Samuelson envisions a day when, quote, anything so crude as a poker chip, a coin, or bill will be dispensed with in favor of records that automatically balance out each person's in payments and out pay payments over the whole of his or her lifetime. So that's the dream of Samuelson, not to have money that you know, if you drop it, it sounds like that. That was a silver dollar. But something that, um, you know, you can get some numbers on. Like <laughs> 50 trillion. <laughs> or if you need more zeros. How about a hundred trillion? <laughs> yeah, not anything like that. You need things like that. That's what you need. Now, anyway, sometimes paper money is kind of fun, though. And I had to pick up this. Yeah, yeah. that's Jack Nicholas. <laughs> And that's the Royal Bank of Scotland in the year 2005. And they made a five pound note with, with Jack, the golden bear on it. So, you know, if you put a golfer on money, it really, uh, I think it'll hold up pretty well. And I think, uh, <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's solid right there. That's, 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 that's good stuff. But anyway, no offense to Jack, love Jack. So anyway, 
money has to begin as barter. Goods, uh, goods were produced by those who were good at it. Um, any surplus they produced beyond uh, what they needed for their own use, they would trade for the products that they needed from others. And for those of you who were here last year, you're going to uh, you're going to have to do this whole wood chopper and egg lady thing again. But uh, you know, if you had trees and you're a good wood chopper, you'd likely have excess firewood. And if you um, were a lady down the road who had chickens, you probably had more eggs than you could eat. So eventually, the guy chopping wood and the woman with the hens uh, would begin to trade, and there would be a egg and firewood exchange rate would, would develop. Maybe one egg for one medium-sized log. Um, of course, these conditions could change. Some of the chickens might die. And if the chickens died, there'd be fewer eggs. So the chicken lady would want, she'd have fewer eggs to barter. So she might demand two eggs for every log. Or if some of the guy's trees burned down, he'd have fewer logs. So he might, uh, he might insist that, that uh, he get two eggs for every log because his, his logs have, uh, have become scarce. So um, that's, that's what, how money developed. And, but the big limitation with barter is the scope of trade. The log man has to find someone who wants logs, but he also has to find someone who has what he wants. Not only do they want to have logs, but they've got to have something to trade that he wants. Same way with the egg lady. She's got to find somebody who wants eggs and has someone who has, to, uh, who has something to trade that she wants. And this is called the double coincidence of wants. And that's the big problem with, uh, with barter. The second problem is indivisibility. You can chop up logs, pretty divisible. Uh, they're still tradable. However, eggs do not divide very easily. So those, that's another problem with, with barter. The other problem is business calculation. Business firms must be able to determine uh, whether they're earning a profit or not. That's what determines uh, how investments are made, as we uh, have learned already. And without being able to calculate, without business being able to calculate, um, who won't know how to invest. It's hard to do under barter. And since not many people will want to trade uh, for what an individual person has, um, um, what they what they try to do is is find something to use as a medium of exchange or an instrument of indirect chain, uh, exchange so uh, in our case uh, logs would probably hold up better than than eggs would in terms of keeping over time and that might be developed as a as a medium of exchange but uh, um, over time a uh, number of a number of items have, have uh, become money. Salt, sugar, cattle, iron hose, teas, calorie shells, cigarettes in prison, famously. Um, I even read where beer was money somewhere. Now, I'm sure you guys have been to a few parties where beer essentially was a, a very tradable commodity, but uh, again, it doesn't hold up well over time, necessarily. But uh, I did re uh, read where beer was uh, was money in some places. So, um, but what will we pick it as money? What are the there's seven things uh, that Murray Rothbard believes should be uh, present uh, in a money, and the first is generally marketable. Whatever uh, the good. Uh, that is picked, it, it ha must have a high non-monetary demand. And again, I would, uh, I would point toward this right here, or that right there, as examples of uh, metals that have held up over time. Number two, divisible. Gold, silver uh, are very divisible. Cows, not so much. Uh, cigarettes, not so much. Uh, salt, sugar, yes, to some degree, but uh, divisibility is important. High value per unit weight. In other words, it's portable. 
Um, cows, again, a problem. Hard to carry a cow around. Um, it's a problem with uh, uh, a number of, of even heavier metals. But uh, gold and silver uh, hold up very well in that regard. Highly stable value. Another way to put this is um, it's expensive to find. There's not much of it. And, uh, and again, gold and silver fit that bill very well. Durable, uh, all the gold that's ever been mined is still above ground, uh, still around, can't destroy it, you can only change its form. Uh, recognizable, again, we go back to that idea that um, there may be other values, your time has value, um, the things you're trying to sell at your garage sale, uh, the little trinkets that had so much value to you, um, they have value to you, but they're not recognizable in value to everyone. Number seven, homogeneous. Um, <clears throat> we may talk about a guy named John Law tomorrow evening, and he had the idea that paper money should be backed by land. This great idea that he shopped around Europe and he got, finally got the uh, French to bite and uh, created the Mississippi bubble. Well, uh, his idea was, uh, again, that all paper money should be backed by land. The problem with land is, amongst other things, uh, it's not homogeneous. The land next door, which is Mama Goldberg's, or the land right here across from this stadium, uh, arguably has much more value than land out in the middle of uh, central, central Alabama. So uh, land is not homogeneous, doesn't make very good money. So, so as I said, uh, two commodities have become dominant to compete as money, and they've been gold and silver over time. So we, uh, economists are often asked, well, what's the optimum supply of money? And uh, Murray, Murray wrote once that economists would never ask the question, what should the supply of biscuits be, or the supply of shoes be, or the uh, supply of titanium be? But people all the time worry about the money supply. And uh, so while we leave it to the market to decide how many biscuits we have, or how many, uh, how many shoes we have, or, or whatever the case may be, um, that's not the case with money. Um, and of course the difference between biscuits and the difference between um, all the things we talk about, all the goods and services, or the goods that we're talking about and compared to money, uh, is the more goods we have, the better. But the more money we have doesn't make us better off. And that's why in the consumption or production, despite the fact that it's indispensable to production exchange of goods, money sim simply transferred from one person's assets to another. So creating more money does not make us better off, despite what a gentleman in Zimbabwe thought, or the economist contemplating Japan's plight, um, or Mr. Bernanke, Making more money does not make, make us uh, more prosperous. As Mises wrote, any supply of money will be equally optimal to another. It doesn't matter what the supply of money is. To increase the supply of money only dilutes the purchasing power of, of money. If overnight everybody's cash balances were doubled, society wouldn't be any better off because real resources, labor, capital, goods, natural resources, productivity have not changed. Prices overall would double, but no one would be better off, with one exception. And the exception would be for those who got the money first. Whoever receives the money first benefits. They were able to get the cash before everybody else, and they were able to spend that on goods whose prices hadn't gone up yet, and they thus Benefits. So while society doesn't gain overall, the early spenders benefit at the expense of late spenders. And that's why I get emails all the time where people say, how could people um, support the idea of the Federal, uh, Federal Reserve or Central Bank or inflation? Don't they know that that's 
it's crippling society, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what people have to remember is there are people who benefit from inflation. And the number one beneficiary is government, because they get the money first. Number two, government contractors. Number three, people who are able to borrow. People who uh, are hurt by inflation are those who get the money last or not at all. People on fixed income, people who are poor. So there are a group of people who benefit when more money is being created, and there are people who are harmed. And um, those who get the money first tend to have more power politically, so that's why it's so hard to get, uh, when you start talking about doing away with the Federal Reserve, uh, doing away with fractionalized banking, things like that, it becomes very difficult. There's people who benefit by increases in money. So if, if, let's say, gold is money, the only way to create supply is to mine more of it. And whether more of it is mined will be determined on uh, whether it can be mined or processed for a profit. Now, it's hard to imagine a, a world where gold is money. But if you can for a minute, you could realize that if there was a big gold deposit, um, significant gold deposit was found. Um, it might um, affect prices, especially near the mine, um, as more and more money has been created. And as more of that gold was created, that money would go down in value, because you'd have more money vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the number of goods that are out there. And thus, the brakes would be put on mining because it wouldn't be profitable to mine more of it. And then, so that's the, the beauty of having a commodity money as, uh, or a commodity as money. Creating paper does not cost much. This didn't cost much to make. None of these did. It, cost, it would cost a lot of money to create this. Forget about the date on it and all that. Ounce of gold um, costs probably five, six, seven hundred dollars at least to uh, to create, and so this would take fractions of a penny to create. So you would only create more money if it's profitable to create the money, just like any other good. Again, money is a commodity like any other. Of course, there's another way to create money. That is counterfeiting. So instead of going to the trouble and the expense of mining gold, say, the counterfeiter mines or produces a, an inferior object, say, brass or plastic or porcelain or whatever, and tries to pawn it off as gold. Um, I always think of this when I see the uh, reproductions on TV of the gold-clad, um, you know, Indian head nickel from such and such, and and I keep thinking, boy, this is gold. How much are they going to want for this? And they say, we want $19.95 if you call right now. Well, that's, uh, of course, they're not creating uh, any sort of uh, official money, but uh, that's, that's what would it be if you were trying to, to counterfeit gold. Gold is very hard to counterfeit. It's very hard to uh, replicate the weight uh, of, of gold, the density of gold, same way with silver. And that's why over time, gold and silver have been, been money. And the sound is a coin, it's easily recognizable. Um, and it's purity, it's very easy to test. Any of you who've gone to a gold show, a uh, coin store, uh, you can see their little apparatus where they can check the purity of gold, so it's very easy to do. Of course, counterfeiting is fraud. Brass is pawned off as gold. Whoever accepts the brass is being cheated along with everyone else. Counterfeit coins continue to circulate. The money supplies increase. The price level will increase. The new counterfeit money dilutes the value of the existing um, money. Counterfeiting is an inflation process that injures all legitimate money holders by having their uh, purchasing power diluted. Counterfeiting to frauds, it injures everyone, and that is uh, what the government does when it creates money out of nowhere. But again, counterfeiters, you should remember 
benefit when that money is created first. Now, I recommend that you not get in the counterfeiting business yourself. The government is, uh, they don't like competition. And uh, as uh, Professor Samuels Samuelson wrote, um, you know, since private individuals can't create money, that's why it has economic value. The government believes that. And if you, go, if you want to get thrown in jail for anything, uh, you're guaranteed to go for counterfeiting. You may not go for other things, but you'll go for counterfeiting. So um, it's not a business that um, you can get away with easily. Now, uh, kings uh, throughout history have been creating money out of, uh, not by counterfeiting, but what they've been doing is clipping coins, sweating coins, uh, crying coins. And what they would do is they would take a coin like this and they would shave a little bit off of it. And they would collect a big pile of shavings and then they'd cre create coins. And of course, they'd continue in this case, they'd call this $20, even though the weight had gone down a little bit. Uh, they would continue to call that $20 and then make a whole new batch of coins. So that's how they used to do it back in the, back in the old days, even, uh, even before the printing press. Kings and governments used to um, create money out of nowhere that way. Well, it's, it was time consuming, uh, generally a pain. And so when paper money uh, came in, uh, that's, that's really when govern, governments could make hay. So, um, and that's really when you started having uh, these paper tickets that said, we promise you to pay you silver uh, or exchange uh, this bill or this receipt for gold or silver. That was a step toward being able to, um, to counterfeit. The other thing that governments put in place is called legal tender laws. Now this, is, uh, this would be legal tender. All of these would be legal tender. And uh, that means um, people would have to take it uh, for all uh, debts, public and private. And um, we kind of take legal tender laws for granted. Um, but uh, in the case of John Law in the Mississippi bubble, he tried to institute them kind of on the fly uh, because he had, uh, he had uh, uh, Bank Royale was creating paper, but there was still silver, gold that was circulating. Uh, he did not want that gold and silver to circulate, so he put legal tander laws in place that only the paper could circulate, and he went and confiscated the gold. Anybody that thinks that FDR was the first, uh, first president or uh, first guy in charge to confiscate gold. He was not. John Law did it back in the 1700s in France. And he also put legal tender laws in place that required people to accept his paper money. So it's only when paper money has been accepted for a long time that government's able to make its, its paper money irredeemable, cutting the link to gold or silver or anything else. And uh, as Murray Rothbard said, that's when government is in seventh heaven. They're not, con uh, they're not constricted by any gold that's in the treasury, that's backing it. They print as much as they want. And certainly in the United States, that's been the case since I believe it was August 15th, 1971, when um, Richard Nixon cut the last little uh, straw to the, to the gold standard. And uh, it's kind of interesting, we had an event in New York um, recently, and Larry Parks, who's done a lot of, of work on uh, uh, monetary work, he compared it to a coat check. I think we've all been in a restaurant, and you've, you put your, your coat away, and they give you a little ticket so that you can get your coat back, right? And he said, um, essentially what the government has done is uh, make coat checks into coats. So they've, they've taken away the coats and we now have coat checks and we're supposed to consider that now a coat. Um, and that's essentially the case with unbacked 
paper money. Uh, that, that crowd appreciated that story much more than this crowd did. <laughs> Uh, but perhaps you just haven't been to a restaurant where they had a code check. Or it might have been my telling of the story. <laughs> Be that as it may. Anyway, gold is uh, uh, once the point uh, where gold or silver is cut from paper, uh, gold then is derided as this uh, bar barbarous relic, as Maynard used to say, or old fashioned. Maynard, of course, in this case, is uh, John Maynard Keynes. That's what Murray used to call him, was Maynard. And uh, so anyway, was, uh, that's old fashioned. If, if you're interested in gold, you're of course a kook. And sophisticated people are the people who, uh, who use paper money. It's only nut jobs who, uh, who are interested in gold. Of course, the demand for gold, uh, we've, we talked about the supply of gold. Now, in terms of the demand, if supply of goods and services increase in an economy. Uh, the demand for money in exchange will also increase. Increased supply of goods produced will raise the demand for money and therefore lower overall prices. And that's what we should have over time. Over time, you should have a more or less steady supply of money and more and more goods are produced and thus the price of goods and services will fall over time. We see that in some in industries. Um, despite the incredible amount of paper money that's being created. Um, but it should be the case with, um, with all goods. And thus goods become more affordable, people become more prosperous, because it's not more money that makes us prosperous, it's actually goods and services. So as prices fall, more goods become available to more and more people, and even poor people over time have um, labor-saving devices or other comfort items. Um, in the case of this country, uh, prices fell from the mid-18th century until 1940, with the exception of war periods. And that's because we were on a somewhat of a commodity standard, at least most of that, most of that time. Now, people, um, demand for money is affected by how frequently we get paid. You know, if you get paid once a month, you're going to hold more money than if you get paid every week. Um, if you get paid on uh, commission that's uncertain, uh, the uncertainty of cash flow, that's going to cause you to uh, uh, hold more money than if you get a, a paycheck more often that's more regular. Um, so all those things uh, reflect uh, the demand for gold. And as I said before, uh, there are countries that are thinking about outlawing cash, um, and you don't see much cash uh, used anymore. Uh, every, every place virtually takes credit cards, and uh, of course that's what Samuelson would want, would, would be everybody using credit cards. Uh, that's what government would like. They don't like cash money. They certainly don't like gold and silver. But in the case of Japan, Japan was thinking about outlying cash, and again, it was this idea that banknotes imply a zero interest rate, and zero interest is too high. They thought that the nominal interest rate should be minus 4%, uh, which is, would rescue them from their downward spiral. So there are these kooky ideas out there, at least we think they're kooky. They think we're kooky, we think they're kooky, uh, about this idea of a zero interest rate being uh, too high. But any sorts of technological developments uh, decrease the demand for money. Uh, any sort of credit cards or the ability to uh, move money around is, uh, decreases, that, uh, decreases that demand. Now the public's confidence in money must be strong for demand for money to be high. Demand for money is very volatile, and while the demand for money in silver is all, while the demand for money in silver is always very high, uh, as far as paper money, it's all driven by confidence. Public expectation of future price levels is far and away the most important determinant of demand of money. Demand of money rises if it is expected the prices will fall. Demand for money falls if the public expects prices to increase. So. Anywhere where you, if you've been in any part of the world where they've had lots of inflation, you will see opportunities to get rid of money quickly. 
like uh, buy gold bracelets or buy rugs or things like that. I mean, anybody who's been in a Turkish bazaar can, uh, can quickly see that uh, the Turkish government has not created, well, they've not treated their uh, money printing uh, uh, very conservatively, shall we say. So people would get rid of their paper money as quickly as possible and buy tangible goods that hold value. Might be rugs, might be gold, might be silver, might be a lot of things. And um, Mises outlined a typical inflation process uh, based on the German hyperinflation. Uh, and, he, and he made the point that expectations don't change suddenly. We get a lot of talk right now is, is hyperinflation going to start next year? Did, you know, is it going to start in the second half of this year? Are we going to have it, you know, whatever? Well, uh, hyperinflation does not, uh, does not take hold very quickly, even if you do get uh, huge increases in the supply of money. And Mises uh, said in phase one, prices don't rise near as much as the money supply. Because the public still has a deflationary expectation. Government thinks this is great, it can print money with impunity. So it's all in the public perception. Government may be creating all kinds of money, but in the, uh, in the uh, public's perception, uh, they still have deflationary expectations. So they're able to get, rid of, get away with it, essentially. Phase two, instead of rising demand for money, moderating price increases, a falling demand for money will actually intensify the price inflation. And that'll, that'll mean that's a point when things are starting to get out of control. We quickly move into phase three. Prices will go up faster than the money supply. There'll be a shortage of money. People urge uh, governments to print more money. Government does this. Uh, prices, money supply uh, spiral upwards. Uh, the value of money is disappearing even as I sit here and contemplate it. I must get rid of my money right away. I buy anything. It uh, doesn't matter what it is. In the case of the German hyperinflation, workers were paid twice a day. Housewives would stand at the gate with the wheelbarrow, um, the money, uh, so that they could take it to the store and buy anything. And of course, famously, uh, if anyone left their wheelbarrow unattended, full of money, uh, the robber would dump the money out and take the wheelbarrow. Um, Bottles of wine would be ordered for dinner. Uh, they didn't care about the wine. The bottle was worth more than anything. So, and when this happens, production fell. People became more interested in speculation than working for wages. Uh, and Germans began to use foreign currencies uh, to, or, or to barter. And of course, the, marks, the mark, German mark, collapsed. 1914, one mark equaled a quarter of a dollar. By October 23, it took 25.3 billion marks to equal a dollar. A month later, it took 4.2 trillion marks to equal a dollar. So you can see this takes a little time, but at the end, things degenerate very, very rapidly. And that hyperinflation um, is really burned into the memories of many, many Germans. And I, I've shown you a couple of, uh, couple of these gems. Uh, Bank of Zimbabwe. And, uh, and of course, these are kind of novelty pieces now. Uh, their currency's collapsed. Um, I'm told they're on the dollar standard. If you're in Zimbabwe, you get dollars out of the ATM machine. But they had a central banker um, named Gideon Gono. And uh, he really thought he knew what he was doing, by the way. And uh, things weren't great when he took over. He took over in 2003, and the annual inflation rate was 619%. So he was uh, brought on to uh, uh, turn the country around. And uh, so by four years later, uh, the inflation rate was 4,500%. That's how well he did. And uh, of course, none of this was his fault. He said it was the fault of his, uh, the former colonial master, the UK. 
he actually said there was a positive correlation between drought and inflation. The more drought you have, uh, the more inflation you have. So central bankers will make up all kinds of things. Uh, so he had said actually in an interview that uh, the droughts were coming more frequently to Zimbabwe and because the droughts were more uh, frequent, um, this caused inflation to spiral out of control. Forget about money printing, inflation's all about the weather, lack of support from nations, political sanctions, that's it. He said no other governor, central bank governor, has had to deal with the kind of inflation levels that I had to deal with, is what he told. The people at my bank are at the cutting edge of the country. That's what uh, he said. And of course, Ludwig von Mises said, um, had uh, anticipated uh, Mr. Gono. Uh, Mises had said, the most important thing to remember is that inflation is not an act of God, that inflation is not a catastrophe of a elements or a disease that comes like a plague. Inflation is a policy. And that was the policy of Zimbabwe. And of course, uh, Bernanke, he believes in inflation as well. And he says, uh, you know, monetary theory or monetary policy is the main tool we have for stabilizing our economy. And so he and uh, Gideon Gono are kind of working off the same page. Uh, and of course, if you, don't have, if you don't have savings for dams and irrigation equipment, um, in the case of Governor Gono, he said, we are printing money to build dams and buy irrigation equipment. Combine that infrastructure and an abundant, abounding energy of our people to succeed, and you have the makings of an agricultural revolution that is bound to take us to levels not seen in living memory. Well, Zimbabwe, I don't know if you know, it used to be called the breadbasket of Africa. It's one of the richest countries in terms of natural resources there ever was, certainly in Africa. And uh, it holds 80% 80, 80 of the world's platinum, has lush soil, um, abundant wildlife, all of that. They essentially ruined it by printing these things. And that's, uh, you know, what... Uh, that's what the printing press can do. But he thought he was saving, uh, he thought he was saving lives. He said, therefore, printing money to sustain lives, to build infrastructure, and a springboard from which to leap forward cannot be bad, he said. He also thought that stock market um, speculation was a cause of inflation. And so he, he closed down the stock exchange in Zimbabwe. And he said, unless there was more discipline and honor, the exchange will stay closed. I can't be bothered. I don't know when it will open. And he, so he had a study done, and guess what the study found? Stock market has been traditionally one of the drivers behind Zimbabwe's hyperinflation. So again, um, central bank governors will come up with, with any reason. He told Newsweek, to ensure that my people survive, I had to print money, he told Newsweek. I found myself doing extraordinary things that aren't in the textbooks. <laughs> Getting Gono, by the way, does have a book. Forgot the name of it. Um, we do not sell it at the Mises <laughs> He said, then the IMF asked the U.S. to please print money. The whole world is now practicing what they have been saying that I should not. I decided that God had been on my side and had come to vindicate me. So actually, God is who told uh, Gideon Gono to print these notes. These notes, by the way, at the end, um, would not buy you lunch down the street. Now, most of the guys who... You know, we make fun of these guys who, uh, these great inflators um, that, uh, you know, we think they're completely clueless. And I think maybe Gideon Gono might have been completely clueless. Ben Bernanke, I'm not sure about. But if we go back to John Law, who I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, he, he knew what he was doing. 
and he knew about the effects of inflation. In fact, he wrote, raising, which means debasing, the money in France is laying a tax on the people, which is sooner paid and thought to be less felt than a tax laid on any other way. This tax falls heavily on the poorer sort of people. And that's exactly what we've been talking about. Poorer people get the money last, and they're worst off for it. And even John Maynard Keynes, he called uh, gold, of course, the barbaric relic, but he wrote in The Economic Consequences of Peace, Lenin is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. By, continu by a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. Lenin was certainly right, he wrote. There is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. Well, hopefully after today, you are among the one in a million who can diagnose inflation, know what real money is, and, uh, and be able to plan for it. And with that, I'm going to close a little early so that we can go down and get a nice picture of ourselves taken. <laughs>